Oh, hello. <laughs> I'm live streaming today slightly differently. Uh, so let me make sure I got things going. Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Ardner Live. And today is all about comics. This event is to replace what would have been an in-person event at Awesome Con, which is one of my favorite shows in Washington, DC. That's why I'm wearing all my Comic-Con badges today, because I was gonna pull out my Awesome Con badges to wear it in spirit, and I realized they're all like, tangled together. But I did find, uh, here's one from 2015. Oh, so long ago. Um, so I feel like I've really been missing all the shows with all the canceled events, I know I'm not alone. So you guys are all with me in spirit and I'm missing our conversations at tables and in person. And so I hope that these videos can help fill the gap and just know that I love you and I miss you all. Um, and, but this is a little warm, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this off. Ah, so, ah, comics. Today, we are going to be making mini comics, which I'm very excited about. This event, like I was saying, it's a virtual event to replace my appearance at Awesome Con. So it's part of my virtual book tour for the dark matter of Mona Star. So thank you all for tuning in. What you guys are going to experience today is sort of a really quick introduction to how I make comics and how uh, how to make your own mini comics. And this is a lot of like what I do want do when I do school visits. I can speak a good, literally fine sentences. Um, but when I do school visits, this is a lot of times what I will talk about. I'm not going to go as in depth as I would on some topics, like my whole backstory and uh, like getting into some of the more details of like logistics of making the comics because there's a lot to go over and this is only one hour. So I'm going to be going through a lot of stuff. If you are interested in getting more in depth in making the comics with me, I am going to be offering a couple, I'm going to be, um, launching some series of comic camps this summer. So if you have any young artists that want to get more in detail and you know making art your own comic, then they can work with me virtually. So I'm going to be announcing those in the next couple weeks. So stay tuned. Okay, so for today, uh, let's see. I'm live streaming on Facebook and I'm on YouTube for the first time. Whoops. YouTube. So in case you didn't know, I have a YouTube channel. I do. Uh, so I'm going to be trying to, I don't know, I'm trying every week. I'm learning a little something more about how to do live streaming. So thanks for joining me on this journey. And if you're curious about getting a copy of The Dark Matter of Mona Star, you can go to my website, which I will mention again later. Okay. So. Do, do, do. And last thing I want to mention before I dive in is that we're gonna be interacting mostly on the Facebook page, which I should open that window so I can see it. Um, so if you want to join us in making our comic, because I'm gonna be asking for some feedback because I cannot write um, a comic by myself. So I'm gonna be asking you guys for some input. And if you have any questions for me, like as an author, please write them in and I'll answer them later. And also, if you like this video, please tag someone who you think might enjoy watching it with us as we get started today uh, and like it and all that stuff. Okay, do, do, do. so let's get started. I'm gonna hop back over to the screen. Okay, so the first step in today's video, how do you make a graphic novel? because the steps that I do to make a graphic novel are actually the same steps that you're gonna do to make a mini comic. But most of us, let's face it, you don't want to make a 200 page comic book right now because who has the mental capacity for that? I feel like doing short stories, like six panel stories are a perfect way to practice the same concepts that I'm gonna be talking about for doing a big graphic novel. Because I think we all have really grand ideas in our head of the projects we want to make, like I have an idea for a 10,000 page book, <laughs> but that's really hard. So maybe just start with drawing a scene from that book. And to me, it takes a lot of pressure off. So I'm going to start with the macro view and then we're going to go to the micro view of how to make, you know, comics because it's hard because you have to both write it 
and draw it. They're two completely different skill sets to be a cartoonist. And I can't tell you the number of times people have asked me, like, oh, so do you just start drawing a book and then you figure it out? And I feel like I'm, you know, breaking bad news to them when I say that you have to actually make a plan that you need to write your story and then draw it because otherwise, I don't know, artists, we're not the best writers. I'm just gonna say it. Uh, we get swept away with a lot, a lot of times more of the abstract concepts. And sometimes we get go in a direction where maybe we don't know how to solve a problem. So you need to make sure you're not gonna paint yourself in a corner and set yourself up for success by sort of coming up with a plot and a world and all that. Um, I always think of this process as sort of you're building a diorama. So you're like, okay, building a world and these are the characters that are gonna be in that world. But the hard part to make, to draw it as a comic is to figure out, well, how do I share this world? Like, where do I come in into this world? What's my entry point? Like, how do I, like, in what order do I present, you know, introduce these different characters and elements? Cause that's the whole sequential part of comics. So first you like create like the world um, and almost like gather all the ingredients that you want to cook with. And then you figure out how to actually put the ingredients together. Um, so for me, it's a little, I like to think of it as we're swinging between pictures and words when we're doing comics. And it can make it hard to get started because you're like, where do I start? Do I write a script? Do I start drawing? What do I do? So to me, I always start with the pictures. And okay, so yeah, so I got my pictures and my words. And I feel like when I'm making a comic, I'm swinging between the two of them. So it's sort of like the chicken and the egg. You can get started in whichever end you want. And you sort of are gonna be swinging between both of them as you, uh, as you plan your comic and then make it. So first I start with the pictures because I am a visual learner. Like a lot of people who are artists, I think in pictures and images and you know, oftentimes more than words as a first language. So for me, I always start the process with just draw your character, you know. I'm gonna be holding up uh, posters um, as my visual aid because I just don't wanna deal with the computer and screen sharing and stuff. So I hope you like analog. <laughs> so first I start by just getting to know my character by drawing them. And as you can see, this is the first sketch I did of Mona and it's like on a piece of notebook paper. So it's nothing special. Um, and I drew her and her matter right here because oftentimes when I first draw my character, I'm drawing either what their issue is or what their passion is. So for like the first time I drew Will from Will and Wit, I drew, I designed um, all these lamps. I designed like 50 or 60 lamps acting like that. Okay. If I was, if I was Will, what, how would I do upcycled lamps out of found materials like parasols and pocket watches and things like that? So I got to know Will through her creativity. Uh, Mona, I got to know more through her pain. So I guess these are my two direction points to get to know a character. They're like, what's their drama? Uh, what's, your, what's your damage, Heather? Or what their real big passion is? Like, what's their dream? What do they love doing? Um, because these are normally, I don't know, to me, it's just the two directions that I go to find to get to know my characters. So when I first draw them, I'll draw them like, I don't know, doing one or the other. So I do pictures, but then I swing back to words because once I see my character, then they start to like talk to me more. It really helps unlock ideas. But also this is my style as an artist. I tend to sort of talk to my characters to get to know them. Some people rather uh, do like experiments. I don't know, there's a lot of different ways to pull the stories out of your characters. So I'm just presenting one way. There's a whole, there's a whole bunch out there. Okay, so for me, I start by drawing the character. Then I write, oh, that's really bright. It's really bright, okay. <laughs> then I'll do like almost like a, an elevator pitch, like a one pager about my story. Um, Think of it as what would be on the back of my book? Like what's one paragraph that describes the whole idea? And I find that writing that's really hard, but it helps me get focused and sort of force myself to explain like what my idea is in my head and think like, oh yeah, do I wanna hang out with this for a while? 
And uh, and for me, because you're not going to get into this much detail with a mini comic, but for a graphic novel, just to go through real fast, the next step I'll do is an outline, just like point, 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 point. These are all the things that happen. And then I'll, the next step after that will be a script. So this is like what my scripts look like. Like this is one page and it has like one, two, three, four panels. And I just describe like what action happens, if there's any dialogue or a text. I know it's not the way you're supposed to do scripts in comics. It should look more like a screenplay. Um, but I just do it this way because I'm, I'm illustrating from my own script. So I don't need to adapt it for anybody else. It's just for me to use. And also I like to save spacing and save paper. <laughs> okay. So I went from pictures to words. Now I go back to pictures again. So when I'm working on my script, I'm actually also using these cork boards to help me visually outline my plot. So my writing process is kind of weird um, because I need, ooh, let's see how to, ah, ah, bear with me while I find a good, oh goodness. Well, you get the idea. Um, so this is an image of one of my giant cork boards that I used while planning out the plot for, for Mona Star. And so you see, I have my chapters here and I have all these little printouts of images. Um, these are actually the artworks the, from my collection of art I call the art no one cares about, which is all my personal work, which I don't know, I throw them up to over 1500 pieces. If you ever want to go down the rabbit hole, you can go on my Flickr. <laughs> um, so, but I spent my 20s putting my 10,000 hours in working at illustrations and sketchbooks. And I collected tons of these images, these individual artworks um, that I wasn't sure what to do with but then later realized that, oh, these are scenes. These are like scenes from a story. Let's figure out what the story is. So when I go to plot out a book like Page by Page or Mona, I actually use art that I've already drawn before to help illustrate what's going on with my character. Um, and so this is what really helps me unlock the plot line because, oops, ah. <laughs> this is an example of a later cork board. Um, where I have the images, this is a better example, where I still have like, oh, here's my black hole heart that I drew years ago, which is perfect for Mona. Um, and then writing in more notes of like, okay, well, what's actually the, the real thing happening that is making Mona feel this way? So I like using cork boards to help me with writing because in a sequential story, sometimes it's hard to tell what order you put things in because it's in a sequence. So this way, everything is in pieces so I can physically move it around. And I find it a lot more helpful for like editing, for, um, for I don't know, um, letting things evolve. Because I take down the boards and put them back up like over and over and over. And each time they're sort of different. So this is how I will, I'll, will have the cork boards while working on my script at the same time. Because for me, I have to see it. I, a big block of text in a script, it just doesn't work in, this doesn't sink in in my head. Um, then I will go back, and so also here's my script where I'm working on my thumbnail sketches. Um, Cause it's, this is the part that's really hard for me because I'm transitioning from building the world in my head, but then, well, how do I actually draw this? Cause if you think as an animator, you think in moving pictures. And so when you're, at this point, you're just pick, you're picking which moments can I show to tell this complete story that I see in my head where I don't have to draw like every little thing that happens. Because in comics, you don't have to show everything. You're just picking out enough beads, you're stringing together enough beads on the necklace for the reader to get what you're saying. And you don't have to, um, I don't know, you don't have to show like everything because also some of it's in the viewer's imagination and you're both showing uh, the story through the characters, but you also have the text. So you can actually tell a lot of story uh, and not a lot of panels if you're really smart. So when I'm working on my script, it's just a hot mess. <laughs> and this is the period where, uh, yeah, I, have, I get decision fatigue because no one tells you that writing and making art is actually a lot of decision-making and problem-solving. <sighs> I know, I'm like, 
am I ready to draw yet? Am I drawing yet? I want to make a comic book because I want to draw. What's up with this writing? I know it's disappointing with the students to break the hard news to them. Um, but okay, the last steps I do before I actually draw out my comic is I will do thumbnails. So, whoa, okay. So here's a blow up because I don't do my thumbnails this big. Um, so this is a blow up of um, how I'll draw my thumbnails. And thumbnails are just a term for the sketch where you plan out how you're gonna lay out your page. And like, to me, it's all about the speech bubbles and the, and the faces. And just so you know, cause I don't draw them that big here. I'll show you, this is how big I'll do my thumbnails. Ah, ah, they don't show up. Okay, well, there's four, oh wait, kind of see. Ah, okay, lighting is too bright, but there's, oh, there's four on this page. Ugh. If you do my comics camp, I'll figure out how to show that easier. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I'll do before I start drawing out my book uh, is I will do some production sketches just to sort of design my character. Let's see, I'm figuring out what angle. Um, so I'll play around because, you know, the first few times you draw characters, they're changing and evolving. So I'll do sort of some warm ups and I'll do like a little sample scene. And actually, this is like a one, two, three, four, like a four panel comic, pretty much. Um, and so this is almost similar to the mini comic style where you're just going to show a scene. So this what I did is just practice while getting to know my characters. OK. And so that is when I will then do the drawing. And of course, there's a couple other steps in there, like there's editing. Uh, I also will make a dummy, uh, which is like my, my rough draft of the book. Um, so, but I don't want to get into too much detail because I don't have much time. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to share some original pages just so you got, so with the drawing side here, I'm going to take this out. Is that the shiny? So here's an original page. Ah, ah brightness. Um, too bright. Okay. Uh, you can kind of kind of see it. Uh, so this is the size that I do my original drawings for for my books. I know it's pretty big compared to how big it's printed. It's almost, I guess, like half this, twice as big. Um, and the reason for this is because it's just hard to draw teeny tiny, especially when you have lots of backgrounds. Because if you draw really small, you're drawing more with like your fingers. And it's kind of like you're whispering. But if you draw a little bit bigger than maybe you're used to, then you draw with like your hand and it's more like you're speaking up a little bit. Um, so I find that I have a lot looser line work if I work like a little bit bigger um, than I'm used to. <laughs> and materials. Like, I keep it pretty simple. So I use watercolor graphite, India ink, and micron pens, and blue, erasable blue pencils, which I'm obsessed with. Um, so yeah, the only thing that I like to do digitally is the lettering, because you can make a font of your handwriting and type it, which is super easy. Uh, and I'll do the speech bubbles that way, because then I can move them around, or I can take them out if I need to. So yeah, I do most of it analog, and then just do... Uh, lettering digitally. So yeah, so if we're doing comics, it's like bat words, pictures, words, pictures. And it ends with words with lettering. Um, so, da -da -da. okay. So I'm going to now, I'm gonna check Facebook to see if we have any questions. Let's see, let's see. Awesome Con in December. Uh, yes, Awesome Con has said that they are going to ho postpone their show until December. It's actually the only show that I've gotten news from about rescheduling. Um, so honestly, I don't know. The past two months have been so insane. I don't even know what's gonna happen in the next four or six. <laughs> so Al, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, okay, so no other questions. I'm gonna go on to a demonstration, um, which is, I feel like it's really fun in person because I get all these ideas from the crowd and I weave them together into a collaborative comic, but uh, this is slightly different. So um, I asked people for a suggestion for a character for me to play with, and I only got one suggestion for uh, Carolyn, 
Carolyn's daughter uh, from over at Wild Rock, she uh, suggested a dragon named Thorntooth as a character. And that is the only suggestion I have received. So instead of debating about it, I suppose I'm just going with a dragon named Thorntooth as my character. Because when you're making your comic, the first thing you do is just get to know your character. I call this the Charles Schultz approach to making comics. Because someone once asked Charles Schultz how he got all of his ideas of what to do with the Charlie Brown characters. And he said, well, I just got to know them and they told me what to do. And I thought that sounds really easy. <laughs> and actually I find this is a really good way, especially if you're doing more of like an improv, like for fun project. Um, it's and if you're not doing it like autobiographically, which a lot of my stuff is, you know, it's a fun break to like, well, just talk to them and see what they want to do. So let's see, I'm gonna switch my screens. Okay. So let's see, I'm drawing a dragon named Thorntooth. Oh great, I'm drawing a dragon. I feel like I've had to draw dragons before and it doesn't go well. Um, okay, we're gonna make this work. Okay, I'm gonna stand here. Okay, so I'm drawing a dragon. Wow, what does a dragon look like? In my head it's, let's think, I guess it's gonna have some wings. Maybe it's got little, I don't know, do they have little horn? Is that snork horn? I don't even know. Uh, maybe, I'm gonna draw like a happy dragon because I'm assuming, uh, this is terrible. Okay, so I got sort of a, uh, now I'm like going off the page. I'm a, also, I'm holding it at a weird angle. Gonna, this is really bad. I love that I'm drawing terrible art live on the internet. And also, what's he doing? I don't know. Okay, I'm just gonna draw this tail. He's got a tail, he's got like a little tummy. He's got scales. I'm a role model. You know, what I role model is vulnerability, especially when you're not you're not sure how to draw something. Um, I'll just give him a bunch of scales. Okay, so we have a little, he's got little teeth, you know. He looks like a, a nice dragon. Okay, and you have thorn tooth. So name. Thorn tooth, the dragon. Ah. Uh. <laughs> okay, normally when I start with a character, um, with a group, the next thing is to figure out, well, yeah, their name. And so the name Thorntooth actually is pretty juicy because you want a name that implies something about your character. Um, that's something that like JK Rowling's really good at with the Harry Potter characters is all their names sort of sound like their personality. Um, so just the name Thorntooth already sends like creative ideas in my head. Um, about who this character is because the next thing I want to figure out besides their name is what do they want? Like, do they have a passion, a dream? I feel like it's sort of the hardest question for anybody to answer. It's like, well, what do I want? What does anybody want? Uh, I think it was Kurt Vonnegut that said, even if it's just a glass of water, your character should want something because that's normally a really big driving force and it makes people care about your character because they're sort of wearing their heart on their sleeve in some way, like, oh, this is the thing that I need, that I want, because there's a vulnerability in that, and I think it makes them relatable. So, wait, I'm gonna check on Facebook. I got multiple screens open. Oh, I'm glad someone thinks he's cute. Thanks, Ramona. <laughs> okay, so I feel, so I'm curious if anybody has any ideas of what Thorntooth the Dragon wants. Some people would call this the motivation. Um, I don't know. I never have, I've actually never taken a creative writing class. So I, you know, not, I don't use those, those terms like climax and uh, conflict and things as much. Um, okay, no suggestions. Okay, right. it seems like this is more Laura Leeds demonstrating how to just create something off the bat instead of the back and forth, which is different, but okay. I'm gonna say that since 
the name Thorntooth, which I like the alliteration. Of course, what pops in my head is because I've been outside with the flowers. It's like every rose has its thorn. So I'm I immediately immediately think of some sort of rose because also Ramona just posted some roses. Um, so maybe Thorntooth is a gardener or florist, um, or I don't know, has something to do with roses. Um, so also that's just sort of pretty imagery. Um, with dragon and roses. I don't know, it's very romantic. Um, so, yeah. So I guess, let's say it's Thorntooth. Let's see. I really am missing the back and forth. Um, okay. So Thorntooth, let's say he's a, a, gar a master. Yeah, maybe he's a master gardener. So, let's see. Great, now how to draw roses. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to give him a little rose with little thorns on it. So he's got a little rose. Um, actually, it sort of re almost reminds me of, what was that story? Frederick the Bull, the bull that like didn't want to fight. And so, you know, he wants to like smell roses, smell the flowers instead, um, which is very against type because you would think a dragon would be all erg, erg. But maybe he's sort of a soft, a soft dragon. Um, okay, so maybe he is a, a gardener. So I'm gonna draw him flying above his garden. Cause also I wanna draw the setting that we're in. So let's see. Maybe he's flying. So I'm gonna draw down here. These are really simple roses. <laughs> dun dun dun. There are roses. We're using our imaginations. <laughs> Maybe some my eyes this way. So the tulip. Oh, that's terrible. Ah. You see, when making comics, you don't have to be the best artist. Really, it's just drawing something. This would be better with like color. Okay, so maybe we got some grass down here. Like I said, this is really simple. I'm gonna draw like a little, little butterfly. Um, okay, so Thorntooth the dragon and, and his awesome rose garden. <laughs> okay, so we have a character with a passion and they're in a setting. Now the other thing that you need to come up with at this point uh, is some other character for your character to interact with because it's a pretty boring story if it's only your character just flying around talking to themselves. I mean, you could do that. Um, but normally it's better if there's another character for them to play off. It just makes much more, much more dynamic universe. So it might be a friend, it might be a sidekick, it might be a family member, it could be a frenemy, it could be uh, an adversary, you know, like a, a rival. Um, it could be, yeah, a lot of things. So I'm curious if anybody has any suggestions for the other character in Thorntooth's universe. If anyone wants to chime in. This is my art nerd dare. Give me some random ideas. Because it could be another dragon, maybe I don't know, one of his flowers comes alive, um, Little Shop Horror style. Maybe it's, um, there's another, like, I don't know, maybe he has a, uh, like a, another gardener, like a Hagrid type gamekeeper. You can go in like a lot of directions. Because also, when you make these decisions, you're also deciding sort of what universe they are in. Like, is this dragon in a universe of all dragons? Or is this dragon sort of in a human world? So to me, I find that when I'm asking questions and just making one decision at a time, that's how I'm actually building my world. Uh, ooh, let's see, a giant slug who eats the flowers. Ooh, an adversary. Uh, a little bird or cat. Oh, a sweet little animal ally. And oh, a deer who eats the roses. Ooh, we got two threats. Uh, a deer and a giant slug. Ooh, I like these. I feel like 
Everything is so rosy <laughs> and thorned to this world right now. Maybe he does need a little bit of conflict. Hmm. How <laughs> do you think this slug? <laughs> well, I do think the slug is a great visual pair for the dragon because the dragon is like up flying really fast and a slug is like down here really slow. So I think that is a pretty fun pair. And uh, visually though, I'm gonna have to like do a zoom in, I think, cause, okay, I'm gonna draw. Also I'm like, okay, what does a slug look like? So I'm gonna draw, <laughs> I'm gonna draw a little, I'm not sure what they, uh, so there's a little, and I'm gonna like zoom in. Uh, little arrow, it's kinda, Ah, confusing. Whatever. My brain. Okay. I should have done like a little uh, magnifying glass. Ugh, whatever. Okay, so we got... They got like... Do they have like little antennae? Is that what they look like? <laughs> and he's got like... He's like, mmm, yum yum. Is that? I don't know. He's like holding on to like a pedal. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I got a I got a weird blobby slug, and now slug needs a name, which it could just be slug. I don't know, because slug is slug, or an S name. <laughs> Thank you, Emily. <laughs> I am a professional artist. Now, this is what always happens when I draw stuff in front of people. It reveals that I work a lot better with visual reference, like a lot of people do. Like, if I want to draw a real slug, then I'll look at a photo of a slug. But drawing from my head, I am just going with what is in my file cabinet, which is more of like a third grade drawing level. Um, so I'm gonna call. Yay! <laughs> I'm gonna. Wanna, I guess I'm gonna call. Let's see, slug, slug, an S name with slug. Slide the slug. Slug the pug. Um, sluggo slim. Sl uh, I'm just going to call him slug. <laughs> oh, slug. Okay. So slug is eating on these roses. So I'm going to have like some, like, maybe this is like a dead rose. I don't know. This is sort of where I'm gathering all the ingredients for my world. Like I was talking about the diorama metaphor, you're just sort of building like a terrarium. Like, okay, these are, this is the world and these are the characters, but then you press play. <laughs> so this is where I'm gathering all my ingredients. And I find that normally at this point, once I draw the characters and the setting and just like, even just a little bit of, you know, their faces show me their personality, then my imagination just starts putting stuff together. <laughs> Doug, oh, Doug the slug. <gasps> Doug the slug. <laughs> Doug the slug. Oh, that's even better. Okay, so Thorntooth the dragon and his prized rose garden, and then Doug the slug who's eaten said roses. Um, so things are not so sunny for <laughs> Thorntooth. Okay, so that's step number one. Pull that aside. Um, so we got our characters. They have names. Um, we have a passion. We have a setting. These are all the ingredients that we need. So next is writing the story. Boo. Um, no, writing, don't be scared. Just think of it as making a plan because I was intimidated about writing a book at all because I'm not a writer writer. But, you know, you don't have to do it like anybody else. So to me, I just, I'm going to break it down into, let's see, I got our six panels. Let's see. One, two, three. All right, hold on. Ah, I really should have like an easel. One, two, three. Okay. Six, six panels. Yeah. Okay. So I think of our six panel comic, I think of it as in sort of like thirds. So we have one third, second third, third, third. So we're gonna start off 
with the first third, but then we're going to have to figure out the end. Because I find that if you just keep going, then you hit a wall. You hit what's actually I call the 80% wall, where you don't know how to finish your story. So we're going to start off doing great and then have to figure out how it ends. Ah! And that way you can do the connective tissue to get there. Um, and I find that this is a lot more successful than you just start and then you see where it takes you. Um, so it's just like a little extra intent. So the first panel is called, oh wait, oh. It's, uh, so your first panel is called the establishing shot because this is where you are establishing where your story is and who is in your story because you don't want your reader to immediately be confused. <laughs> so the establishing shot, it might actually be something similar to what you did for your, you know, I also call this my mood board um, where I'm gathering all my ingredients. It might be similar to this sort of establishing your character, you know, doing the thing that they're passionate about. This is a classic opening in stories, which is you see in like movies and musicals and things where it starts off with your character like, oh, I have a dream. And that way, when something gets in the way of them making their dream happen, then you're rooting for them. You're like, ah. Curse that dog. Um, ooh, I think I'm a little behind, so I gotta, no wait, no I'm not behind, okay. Just double checking my time. Whew. Since an hour, flies by. Okay, so, here, let's see, I'm gonna switch over to here. Can I put him up? I'm gonna put him up over here. Let's see, can we see him? Ah, uh, kind of. Okay. <laughs> problem solving. Okay, so our establishing shot. I'm gonna have Thorntooth the dragon, I guess, uh, maybe in the garden, um, like pruning or doing some sort of maintenance, like admiring, wow, like look at my garden. I hope, you know, maybe to give it a sense of urgency, you could have a driving force like, oh, there's a flower show or a competition or something that makes it more, um, like more important, the roses are are thriving and doing well, which makes slug, Doug the slug even more of like a an issue. Um, so I'm curious if anybody has any idea as to what Thorntooth wants to do with the roses. Um, <laughs> okay. Well, I'm just gonna go with. Let's see, maybe a back, like a, a best, yeah, I'm just gonna, you know, some sort of competition, some sort of rose uh, competition. So just make up something. So I'm gonna start off in my thumbnail, it's gonna be really simple. Let me switch over to the screen. It's gonna be super simple <laughs> uh, because also it's really little and this is a big fat pen. <laughs> let's see, oh, here, let's, what's that? Yeah. Okay, so let's have, like, let's see. Roses. These are roses. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Okay, so this is more like close up. So I'm going to have. So he's going to be like. Holding on, like maybe like sniffing, like sort of like oh oh I just realized they don't they have like little spikes oh I should give them little spikes or is that dinosaurs oh yeah I almost forgot okay okay maybe we see like a little bit of the wing. Okay, maybe uh, maybe Thorntooth has like a little belt with like some scissors or something, <laughs> you know, accessories. Because the little details actually help like really tell your story. Um, so maybe here Thorntooth is thinking, because of course you got the, oh, I don't know if you can see. Okay, oh, it's got the little cloud here for a thought bubble. 
and maybe Thorntooth is thinking like, oh, my flowers will win best in show for sure this year. Um, my flowers will win this year. It's also, this is exposition, <laughs> you know, uh, cause maybe this also is sort of implying that maybe he hasn't won for a while. Um, like maybe this year is my shot, uh, something like that. Um, and maybe, and so then normally the next panel would be good for introducing another character. Like everything is fine and rosy in this garden, but then dun, dun, dun. So actually I could set it up here by putting really small, um, I could put little slug like real small on one of the roses. Cause in comics, you're always sort of setting up the next panel in the previous one, uh, especially if you only have six panels. Uh, so I'm gonna like put little Doug the slug in here. He's like, nom, nom. <laughs> so he's like, mm, tasty. So then maybe this next panel will be when Thorntooth sees Maybe uh, notices a rose that's like chomped and then sees Doug. That's like an extra step. Maybe he'll just see Doug. Because also when you're writing your story, you're thinking about what do you want to like build up and lead, create more suspense versus just get to the point. So we're just going to get to the point. So he's like, oh, my flowers are going to be so great. And then like zoom in. So I'm going to draw like. Wait, does he have like a little face? Oh, slugs. He looks sort of like a a cat, a horse, I don't know. Oh yeah. So he's got like a leaf. He's like chowing down. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I was right. Doug. Uh, when in doubt, label things. Wow. Okay, so maybe here we see like, let's see, more like, Oh, he looks like a horse. Oh, let's make him look. He's like, ah! So here I've zoomed in to see the slug bigger. And now we have like a close up, like, oh no. You also, also I could change this dialogue to uh, thorn tooth you know, like oh this rose is messed up like what's wrong like they're all looking so great so you could sort of angle it that way which is why I do the text last because you can change it as you go okay it's like oh no uh, my my roses because also the dialogue is what we call exposition so he could say something here like Oh no, this slug is eating my roses. So ideally you should make it clear through the slug, the slug is eating the roses, but in case you wanna be like really clear, you can have like, you know, the dialogue sort of explain what's going on. Cause also sometimes if your art, you draw it and it doesn't look like clear of what you're trying to say, the dialogue can really help you uh, make it more clear. Okay, so we're already, a third of the way through our comic. And now we gotta figure out how it ends. So uh, our dragon, he wants to win this flower competition um, and the slug is in the way. So our question is, does Thorntooth get what he wants or does he not get what he wants? Because if he gets what he, what he wants, then it's a comedy. And if he doesn't, then it's a tragedy. <laughs> And if they get what they want, but it's not how they expected, then it's more of a dark comedy. <laughs> um, so it's funny when I work with kids, like we often go into like a dark direction, um, which is always really, you know, it's fun for me because I don't know, I love when my characters get what they want, but sometimes it's fun to sort of, I don't know, throw them some into some crazy situations. So let's see, Thorn Juice. Thorntooth enjoys the taste of cat slug hybrids. <laughs> oh no. Oh yeah, maybe my roses have slime. Oh yeah, maybe he's like leaving a little slime. He's like a slimy slug. Yeah, cause he could notice you're like, oh, there's slime. Like, where is it going? He follows the trail and he finds them. 
Okay, that's see, once you get started, that's when you figure it out. You, it's like when you're right, creating a story, you're building the bridge while you're flying it. So um, even just talking through it here, I'm figuring a lot out. So I'm curious, internet, does Thorntooth end up getting into this, you know, getting his, his roses into this garden show and win? Does uh, Thorntooth get what Thorntooth wants? Like, how much do we like Thorntooth? <laughs> so if anybody has any opinions, um, Doug and Thorntooth become besties and grow roses just for Doug. Oh, see, this is also a classic sci-fi. I always think of sci-fi with this, um, perhaps because I was just watching an episode of Star Trek Next Generation that sort of taps into that, that if Doug has needs to survive, that maybe there's another way for, um, for Doug to get roses and what he needs. And so they can both be happy. Um, so that is a good idea. <laughs> uh, Cause also it's a lot easier to do problem solving with other characters, but it helps you also learn better how to solve problems in your real life. Um, okay. So we know it's going to end with the, uh, with Thorntooth, uh, with the roses being protected and being in the show and like doing great. And Doug has his own, maybe his own designated flower bush that's only like slugs only. <laughs> um, but to get to that point, they need to get to some agreement because that implies that they become friends. So they need to have a little bit of dialogue to show them coming together so that Thorntooth doesn't just, you know, breathe fire on him and murder him, that he... <laughs> Uh, comes to an understanding like, oh, Doug is a slug and he needs to, he has a right to be here just like I do. So let me think. So we know we're going to end with like the flowers and the roses. So here we'd have to have, see, this is where I like cork board because then I can write down the different steps and move them around. In fact, I'm going to, maybe I'll, well, I'll just do it out loud. Because also I'm skipping the script step where you write down the six things that happen and then thumbnail it. I'm sort of doing both steps at once. So it's a little harder for me to improv. Okay, my roses. So maybe this panel will be when Doug is like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just really hungry. <laughs> like your roses taste so good. So flattery, that's a very good thing to do when a dragon is angry at you. You flatter them. So maybe here Doug's like, uh, oh, but you're like, I'm a really picky eater. Like I only eat organic rose. <laughs> um, you know, you can sort of like a jerk in there. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in closer to just Doug for this panel here. Let me come closer. Cause also I'm showing you guys that we're switching up the camera angles. So it's like, we start far away, get closer. And now we're going to get even closer. So maybe slug turns around. Maybe he's like, oh, that's his, that's his arm. <laughs> he has like tiny little arms and he's on a flower petal. He's on a leaf or something. And little tiny eyebrows. So he's like, oh, maybe he's sweating because he's scared. Um, visual indicators are always helpful to imply what's going on with your little tiny character face. Uh, so maybe here, Doug has like, maybe he's also, they're both sort of like, oh no, oh no, like it's bad for everybody. So maybe down here he's like sweaty and so he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, maybe he's been, maybe his home environment was, he was lost um, because of development. And so that's why he lost his previous food sort of, I don't know if you can, depends how much detail you want to get into. So I'm just going to say like, I'm sorry, your roses taste so good. Your roses are the best. <laughs> it's funny that Slug is like, oh, your roses are the best, which is what, uh, Thorntooth wants. It's just not how he want, you know, thought. 
You're the bosses are the best of what's around. And I'm so hungry. Maybe it's a mama slug and she's trying to like support her new baby. I don't know. <laughs> See, now I'm just going to all these rabbit holes. Um, okay, so next one uh, sounds like it would be Thorntooth uh, developing empathy for poor little dog the slug. <laughs> so maybe here would be like, oh, um, like, uh, like, oh, that's so sad. Or, um, best or, or maybe he's like, oh, really? They're the best? Um, but you can't eat them all because I have a flower show. And maybe that's when they're like, oh, well, I have an idea. Okay, so I'm going to have, I'm going to zoom back out for, for this one. Oh, sorry if you can't see it as clearly. It's hard to light well, but not over to blow out the, the paper here. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm also in the restaurant. I'm very hungry. So maybe here we'll see. Um, actually, I'm gonna have him. I'm gonna have Thorntooth pick up Slug. Um, that little, little tiny. He's like a little tiny Slug in his hand. Um, sort of a human hand. Well, whatever. Dun, 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 dun. Oh, his little <laughs> no. Like I said, this is a thumbnail sketch. Okay, so maybe here, Thorn Tooth is like. It's also the eyebrows. It's all about the eyebrows. So giving him more like the sympathetic eyebrows here. So like maybe like a like a like a finger. Maybe a finger like he's he, like he's thinking, you know, yeah. Like you think they're the best? Okay, so he's like, oh, you really think they're the best? It's like, oh, yeah. Um, so maybe this one is when they propose, like, well, I, what about if I, maybe there's a way that we both can get what we want. And then the final panel will just be showing um, Doug the Slug with his rosebush and maybe Thorntooth is, like, coming home with, like, a ribbon. Um, like, oh, I did it. And it's like, we did it. You know, like, you didn't do anything. Because um, also, this is sort of like a confidence boost. So maybe up here, so maybe we'd make Thorntooth more desperate up here. So like, oh, I hope, you know, like there's some, uh, some imperative, like, to make it like, oh, he really needs this confidence boost. And the slug is sort of giving him confidence boost. Um, really nice. Uh, so, so I get maybe the Doug the slug suggests it. Do the best. So I'm gonna change this dialogue. But I need to enter them in the show. Well, whatever. Okay. So maybe here, Doug the Slug will close up on him again in hands. That's, you know, oh, it's kind of a backwards hand. Um, maybe has like a little light bulb <laughs> where he's like, I have an idea. Like, oh, I don't have an idea. Uh, you can always do the trick in comics of having, like, you know, later or the next day or, you know. So I'm going to draw, like, a little, maybe a little banner at the bottom. Later that summer. Ah. Uh, 
And then the last panel, I'll have like a, a bush with like a sign in front of it that's like for slugs only or something. Um, we're like, this is Doug's uh, rose bush. Slugs in the grass. Who knows, maybe Doug the slug has like a slug family that it comes to and they you know make a new home. Cause maybe Thorntooth is really lonely out here and he needs company. So he's been fixated on like winning the prizes, but maybe he also needs a friend. Cause friendship is also the number one driving motivation for characters and for people. Um, so I'm gonna have Doug. It's like, actually, I'm going to give a trophy just because. <laughs> like a trophy. He's like. Wow. This is so small. It's a little challenging. Maybe he's like swoops in and has trophy. First place. <laughs> Oh, also, we don't have their names in here because you need to work their names into your script so we know what their names are. Um, so maybe in the first panel, uh, Thorntooth is talking to himself, so thinking to himself, so like, Orth oh, Thorntooth, your flowers will do great this year. Oh, no, my roses. Oh, okay. So I'm just saying I need... So maybe in this panel, we'd have Doug introduce himself. I'm sorry, this is not the best around. So hi, my name is Doug. Okay, so that like works in. So maybe here, Doug is like, Thorntooth, you did it. Ah. Uh, and Thorntooth is like, we did it. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> we both win. Yay. And it's like happy. <laughs> and maybe there's the other rose bushes back here that's like for show. Ah. Uh, okay. This is our masterpiece. It's kind of probably really a little bit hard to see. So I'm gonna flip my screen over to the Facebook. Um, I'm curious if we need a title for this masterpiece. Um, <laughs> let me click on that. Okay. Don't. Wait. I'm gonna. This. I'm not seeing comments. So, okay, for a title, I will just come up with a title. So normally the title is what I figure out last and the title a lot of times it can include like what I'll normally do for a title is I'll look at my script that I wrote out like the six things that happen and I'll just look for the key words that pop out at me. So I'll, like just nouns of the words that create that are most prevalent in your story. So like dragon, rose, um, friendship, garden, you know, I will look at those words and think about what pops out to me as capturing the energy of your story. And it might also have the name of your main character or the two main character, the two characters. So for this one, let me think. And of course I love puns and alliteration <laughs> when it comes to titling. So maybe every rose has its slug because <laughs> I said that song lyric before. So that's rattling around in my head. Every rose has a slug. Um, I don't know. So unless someone else has a better idea, that's what I'm gonna. Oh, slimy roses. <laughs> slimy roses. <laughs> okay, so that means like, oh no, my roses are slimy. Okay, because we have if we have the title of slimy roses, then you really gotta like. Make sure that I'm fitting that in there. Um, slug slime. So maybe like there's like a slime reference down here too. 
Do you think every rose has a slime? Oh, it's slimy. See, slimy roses, it does sound a little, hmm, does sound a little like gross factor. So I think I might go with every rose has a slug. Um, Cause also that's sort of, I don't know, to me that captures more the spirit of like, it has a, that, yeah, there's more of a positive. Um, so I'm just gonna write the title here. Every rose has a slug. And boom, we've made a comic. <laughs> ah, it's a masterpiece. <laughs> Okay, so I've modeled, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you guys for chiming in on this with me. Um, it's a little challenging to do without the in-person interaction, but I'm glad I got some input from you guys. So thank you for partnering with me. Uh, and now, oh shoot, I'm like already out of my hour, so I'm going to go like really fast. Um, so as always, things take longer than you think. So real quick, um, Larkin is sharing the link to my com mini comic handouts on the Facebook page. So it includes, let's see if I can get this to show up. Oh, it's really light. Oh, shoot. All right, you can kind of kind of see it. Well, there's a, this is a handout that's my writing worksheet. So you can see it has these boxes on it. So it's basically just a worksheet for you to plan out the six things that happen in your story and a little square over here to do a little thumbnail sketch. So this is basically the, the thumbnail sketch. Um, and then there's boxes for you to like create the title and write what you wanna put on your back cover, that sort of thing. It's just a way to plan out your comic. Then on the back, on the other side, um, the next page is a little guide on how to fold your mini comic. Uh, ah. But also, yeah, there's a lot of videos for that too. Um, for folding an eight page mini comic. Then there's a handout with camera angles, um, which I didn't get too much into because that's a little more next level. But those handouts and one with speech bubbles um, are being shared. So, and they're also on my website in the learning page in case you want to go there. That's where I've been putting all my handouts. Um, so with the mini comics, just to show you guys some examples, my favorite two example mini comics are actually from the first time I taught mini comics at Camp Sequoia, maybe five years ago. Um, and I like it because one is a horizontal format and one is a vertical. Oh, it's light here, maybe I'll. Ah, so this one is called Dead Weight, about a bird who he's too fat to fly, so he like works out. Um, doesn't he have so much muscle mass? He's so heavy. He's like, no, I can't. Look, I can't carry myself. Um, so yeah, it's a tragic story. Uh, and this one, which is a talking cube. So when anyone's like, I'm not a good artist, I can't draw. I'm like, well, what about just different sides of a, cube, of a cube and one side steals the Nutella and the others cry. Um, so you don't need to be uh, like a realistic, like technical artist to make comics. You just need a clever idea. Um, and uh, yeah, that's really all you need. Uh, so these and then another, here's like another example of one. This is more of like a, actually this girl is more of a, I think she's actually studying illustration in college. But it's about a, a wizard and a fairy, so it's called Two Kinds of Magic. Oh, okay, it's kind of hard to, to see. But I love the mini comics format because it's, uh, a lot of us in comics get started small. And even if you go to a show like SPX or something, uh, um, a lot of artists will share, sell these at their table for like a buck or two. And so I've actually just started getting back into making mini comics. So one I did recently is called Dear Sad Me. But I have other ones about like self-care and art and love and stuff. So I've been getting back into this format myself because it's just a really great way to get ideas out really fast. And you can photocopy it and boom, you're like self-published. Uh, they're also really easy to mail and share with people. It's very punk rock DIY. Uh, <laughs> and for you, if my worksheet um it doesn't if this isn't like the best format for you maybe you would rather 
use post-it notes and stick them on your wall. Or maybe your plan is more like a flow chart. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways that you can approach it. But I find six panels is pretty, is pretty easy to actually get finished. Um, okay, so since I am low on time, I'm just gonna see if there's any questions in the comments. Let's see. Some reason when I click on, can you see all the comments? Oh, it's weird when I'm live streaming and I try to access the comments, I only see like the top few, but I see there's a lot and I don't know how to do it and I don't want to waste time. Ah, uh, so I guess, let's see. To wrap things up, I'm going to, well, thank you, Carolyn, for suggesting the dragon character. I'm gonna send you a little mini comic and sticker bundle as a thank you. Um, and do, do, do. let's see, I guess, all right, I guess I can demonstrate really quick how to fold a mini comic. I'm gonna do it really fast because over time. Okay, so start with a sheet of notebook paper. First, you're going to fold it uh, horizontally like this. So that's two sheets of paper. <laughs> okay, so I folded my paper like this to this. So this is like a mountain, mountain pose. And then you unfold it. Now you're going to fold it. See, I do this automatically. Now you're going to fold it the other way. So, vertically. Wait, I'll get myself in. Let me do it. I do it automatic, like on autopilot, so I'm actually breaking it down by step. Ah, okay. So we folded it, fold it this way, and we folded it this way. And now at this point, I'm going to fold each end around the middle. I feel like this is hard to teach when it uh, in this way, but I'm ah. also I probably would have a camera set up on a table. Uh, So I'm folding each of these sides into the middle. Also, I'm doing this really fast. <laughs> so now I have like a W. Um, so now I'm going to cut it right here in the middle. Ah, it's hard when you cannot see when the paper just looks like really bright white. So like I said, I'm sure you can find a million videos online. So I cut it in the middle and I'm gonna, this is the tricky part. You cut it, then you pull it down so it makes like a plus sign. And once it's the plus sign, then you just flatten it out. Ah, and you have a little mini comic. Ah, or a zine as some people call it. Okay, that was okay to demonstrate. <laughs> okay, so. To wrap things up, I Artner dare you all to make a mini comic at home. And if you do make one, please share it with me on social media or even mail me a copy if you want to. Uh, and if you're interested in my upcoming comics camp. Oh, I forgot. I had other signs. I forgot to use them. Ah! Live. Okay. Upcoming, I do have my comics camp, which I will be announcing in a week and a half. I believe, yeah, in like a week and a half. I will be announcing my comics camps this summer. Where we'll be getting more in detail for ages 8 to 15. So stay tuned. And if you want to get a copy of Dark Matter Mona Star, you can go to my website, whoislaurelee.com. And my video next week is on Sketchbook Dare Drawing. Uh, we will be on Facebook and on YouTube. So this will be activities from Sketchbook Dares. Uh, I'm gonna customize a couple of them for our current situation in the world. So, um, so that'll be fun. And so it's coming up. So I wanna thank you all for tuning in to this week's edition of Artner Live. 
And thanks, Laura and Larkin, for helping out with the love and support and the links. And also, thank you all for tuning in. And uh, until next week, I'm wishing you all a healthy and inspired rest of your day. May you be well. May you be weird. And I love you all. Mwah! Have a good rest of your weekend.